Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. So today I'm going to talk about a problem, classic problem uh, in philosophy of logic that, uh, however, has a lot of repercussion also in other areas of philosophy, uh, like philosophy of mind, epistemology. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the philosophy of language, philosophy of logic side, but in the Q&A I love, I love to see, uh, I, love, I love you to pass me on uh, uh, how my view uh, can extend to other areas. So the, the classic problem is uh, uh, the Lewis Carroll um, uh, regressive premises. So um, in order to introduce the problem, um, I'd like you to visualize a logic teacher who uh, tries to illustrate how to do a derivation um, to students and starting with the premises uh, and, and to conclude uh, by using a, a explicit appealing to a logical rule, the rule of modus ponens. So he will single out the premises and then we conclude to Q from P and P and Q. Now, uh, in evoking this uh, rule of inference, what is he doing? Right? Luis Carroll has taught us that um, is not, what he's not doing um, is adding an instance of the logical truth as a further premise. Why not? Well, because if that is what he's doing, then you would have an uh, infinite regress of the premises. So you can see on your handout, suppose you start with A, and if A then B, and suppose uh, using a rule is a matter of instantiating the logical truth, such as uh, B and P uh, on your handout, then you instantiate for the premises, and you get if A, and if, if A then B then B, so you have a third premise, and then you can ask, how do I get to B? Well, presumably by modus ponens, but if using modus ponens is a matter of instantiating the logical truth as a further premise, then you can do that again and use one or two, uh, the conjunction one or two, together with a, a three. Uh, and so you get a, a fourth premise that says, if A and if A then B, and if A, uh, if A, uh, and if I don't be, then be, and so on, right? So you get the regress. So this was, uh, you know, the main uh, message for many people of what the Lewis Carroll regress tells us about using a logical uh, rule in the course of an argument. Uh, it tells us that logical inferences, uh, sorry, the uh, inference rule and logical truth are not the same thing. That's in a message. Um, in fact, um, Many people think that that's the main diagnosis of the, the class. And uh, if you take an introductory class in logic, you know, I remember Professor Berna was telling me using that argument to motivate the distinction, you know, between the inference rule and logical truth. Good. Um, now, uh, you see many people uh, thinking that that's the really main me me message of the um, argument. Um, but, uh, for example, I haven't yet out uh, the verbal distinguishing between a non rule and non logical truth, a round fit distinguishing uh, general principle, and kind of ability that you get by non a rule. And the particular damage really explicitly says the moral of the address is that the argument of the form A, that's P, A, P, and Q, that's for Q cannot be identified with a conditional schema, if P and if P and Q and Q, nor with a uh, universal sentence for every P and Q, if P and P and Q and Q. So there seems to be, no, that's a main message. Now, um, this uh, kind of verdict always left me unsatisfied because um, it's really only negative. It tells you that rules are not logical truth, it tells you that using a rule in the course of an argument is not a matter of instantiating a logical truth as a further premise, but it doesn't tell you what it is to use a logical truth in the course of an argument. Right? It doesn't tell you why it is that by using it, uh, you can avoid starting with a guess. Um, so that got me interested in the kind of semantics of arguments in English, or what um, it means to make an argument in English. And given that arguments are singled out, but these little words like therefore, thus, and so, I uh, started thinking about the semantics for these words and whether you know, they're looking at the meaning of those words and the way we use it in our daily language when we make arguments in English can help understand uh, 
and cast light on uh, the nature of the regrets and what to visit. Right. All right, so, um, so what we're going to do now is to look at a little bit of the semantics of the form. I'm not going to inflict you the whole semantics because it's painful. Uh, <laughs> you have it in the end. Um, okay, so therefore, it's more that um, uh, for some reason, uh, as I attracted a lot of philosophical attention, you know, philosophers of language have been working on everything, on every single word. Uh, but not, not that much in the four. Uh, Grassi talked about it a little bit, and uh, has given a view of the other four that has been um, uh, really the author that you see for a while. According to it, uh, when we use the four in a sentence such as 1A, Jill is English and she's a poor brave, um, what we are doing is uh, uh, conventionally uh, implicating that if uh, Jill is English, then she's brave, but the truth of that uh, implication is not necessary, is not required for the truth of the conjunct right, of 1A. So according to his view, you could say truly 1A right, without uh, it being true that if she is English, therefore, she, she's, then she's brave. Uh, so call the target content, content um, this uh, 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 putative implication by the form. Uh, as many, uh, as some, some people have noticed already, um, it's doubtful that the four sentences like uh, 1a um, or 2a really um, uh, don't require the truth of the type of content for them to be true. So, you know, you can see that things like 2a is an infelicitous, and there is red hair, and it's the fourth female. Sounds weird. Um, if I say 13 is a number instead of 4 odd, it's a uh, uh, kind of Now, of course, you can always explain this example away and say, well, because the conventional picture is false, then uh, the sentences are um, come out weird. Um, but I don't think that's really the right diagnosis uh, uh, here because. Um, if you look at the distribution of the four, so the four doesn't just appear in parenthetical like 1a and 2a, it also appears um, in uh, real argument uh, forms. So, for example, in 3 you have humans, animals, um, George is a human, therefore George is an animal. So, that seems that syntactically, therefore, takes premises and a conclusion into an argument. Right? And uh, you may think, well, truth stands to a sentence like soundness tends to an argument, right? And uh, soundness of an argument clearly requires the validity of the argument, so the premises of the conclusion, right? So, but if you think that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, important to give a uniform semantics of the four across the four sentences and the four arguments, then you may want to say that the truth of the four sentences also require uh, uh, validity of the inference. Okay, so that it's a one consideration um, that you know should move us uh, toward a different view of uh, the meaning of the four, and uh, um, you know the projective behavior of the four really suggests that what we're dealing here is like a, what philosophers of language and linguists call a presupposition. Um, so, uh, so the difference between a, a content that is encoded in a, a sentence. Um, uh, and the content that is presupposed by a sentence is a difference that you can um, observe by using this projectability test. So, um, for example, uh, take a sentence like, uh, it's not the case that Jill is English and that she's the four brave. Right? So, suppose uh, the meaning of the four uh, was equivalent to a sentence like, uh, Jill, Jill is English and from that it follows that she's brave. Um, so in that case, uh, under the negation, you couldn't uh, uh, derive that if she is English, then she's brave, right? But uh, 6C is that um, uh, still uh, requires for the truth of it that if she's English, then she's brave. So that, that's just a way of saying that the, the content, the target the content projects out of negation, and they suggest there's no part of the a tissue content of the sentence, <laughs> rather it's presupposed by the sentence. And that's a very standard argument for, uh, 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 for uh, um, finding a, a presupposition tickets. So, so. 
Okay, so now suppose uh, the four is a presupposition trigger, then uh, I think you can explain uh, a lot of stuff about the four sentences and the four uh, discourses. Um, so first of all, um, you can uh, um, understand the projective behavior of the four sentences. Uh, you can also uh, explain the difference in challengeability of uh, the four sentences from, for example, follow sentences. So, for example, say for uh, A, for uh, B, and five A and five B. Um, so it would be weird uh, to challenge five A by saying that's false. Um, you cannot uh, directly challenge the position. Uh, and what I mean is, you couldn't really say that um, it's false that if she is English, then uh, she's brave, but you think that's false. Uh, whereas you could do that with 4B. So it means that you know, follow uh, is part of the content of 4A, whereas um, um, the target content is not part of the, the, the additional content of 5A. That's one uh, other reason we should think of the 4 as a presupposition figure. And finally, um, uh, I think a very good reason we have for thinking that the four um, is a presumption trigger is that um, the four sentences um, show a content sensitivity um, that um, can be easily analyzed in terms of lo local context, which is the user machinery people invoke when it, ca when it comes to giving analysis of presuppositions. So take, for example, eight. Uh, so Mark is a progressive and is a four in the north. Uh, that can be true in the context. For example, uh, suppose a sociological uh, experiment is conducted with a group of subjects that include Mark, or all the progressive subjects of experiments to now come out from the north. Um, but of course, you know, uh, Mark being a progressive does not entail that he's from the north. Um, and so you, know, you can explain from the sensitivity of A, by appealing to uh, the uh, machinery of the context, and what you do is, uh, you know, have all the derivation here in, uh, in the handout, but I don't know if I can go through it. Um, um, so here the idea would be that um, um, presupposition are, are expected to be satisfied within the local context, and the local context is the context augmented with um, the um, uh, uh, the, the closest to the music fragment. So in this case, uh, for example, you know, a sentence like nine, Mary went to the bank and Mark went to the to school two is unfelicitous because the position two is not satisfied with the closest uh, the, the closest the sentence. All right, so then what I say so far is that uh, it seems there's a lot of reason why we want to take uh, the four to be a presupposition figure. Um, so when we use the for in the of an argument, we uh, don't assert that the premise is uh, into the conclusion. We don't even conventionally imply that, but we presuppose it. Right. All right. Um, if you want to look at uh, the all the uh, um, you know semantics, you're free. Yeah. Uh, work through it. Uh, I don't think I have much. Do you have much time? You have um, about. You have about. You finish. So I will give you a warning in five minutes. So you have ten minutes. Ten minutes. Right. So, uh, but what I want to do is to go back to uh, the regress. Right. So why is it that doing all these semantics I help with the regress? Well, so. Um, this kind of semantics give you an account of the um, semantic for the argument schema, uh, on which the argument schema, uh, as you would expect, presupposes um, uh, a logical truth. So, in the case of uh, monospondence, the argument schema corresponding to monospondence presupposes the logical truth of monospondence. And each instance of the argument also presupposes an instance of the logical truth. So, um, this is what the semantic gives you. So it tells you that using an instance of conditional schema, such as uh, C in the course of an argument, is not a matter of adding a further premise, a split premise to the argument, but rather is a matter to presuppose uh, that premise in the course of an argument. Uh, because it's a matter of presupposing, um, uh, 
presuppositions are not available as premises that can be uh, to which the law can be further applied. Right? And so, um, presupposing uh, these logical truths um, does not give rise to whatever mechanism gives rise uh, to the defense. Um, so, and it, it, on this view, and independently motivated semantics for the argument schema and um, for uh, um, therefore can explain what it means for one to use uh, a rule in the course of an argument to explain why that by itself does not trigger the rest. As you said, um, you get uh, triggered when you use a logical truth as a further premise. Now, why is that interesting philosophically? Well, there's other applications that I think um, uh, this idea uh, you know, uh, applies to natural um, So people are, uh, in epistemology and philosophy of mind are worried about um, what makes a certain causal transition between belief states, a piece of reasoning. Uh, so it's very tempting to think that deductive reasoning is a sort of because of the transition between belief states, that you have belief states as premises and belief states as conclusions. Uh, but not every cause of transition is an instance of reasoning, right? So for example, suppose I um, um, suppose I see my friend Aline, and that uh, makes me emotional for some reason, and I drop the coffee on my shirt. And then I see that, and I come to believe, that uh, my shirt is stained. Uh, that's a transition, a positive transition to belief states. Right? But it's clearly not an instance of reasoning. Right? You don't want to say that that's an instance of reasoning. Right? So, what makes an instance of reasoning, uh, sorry, uh, an instance of positive transition, an instance of proper reasoning, um, and why it's, it's different from uh, any uh, other sort of positive transition between belief states? Well, many people have thought that uh, the difference is that you have, uh, in, the, in the reasoning case, you have a further belief, linking belief between the premises and the conclusion. But you can see that if you add a further belief to your premises, uh, for example, the belief that if A, then, uh, uh, if A and if A, then B, then B, then uh, you get something very analogous to the kind of progress that started with. Um, and so if you want to avoid the regress in that case, you have to give some other story about what makes a causal transition a, a piece of reasoning. In my story, what makes a causal transition a piece of reasoning is that um, a causal transition um, doesn't... Um, uh, is, so a piece of reasoning is an addition, causal transition, causal transition that uh, where the, uh, it's presupposed that the premise is in the conclusion. So because it's presupposed that it's not available for um, as a explicit premise and that this explains why we don't get to the best. Um, so we, have, we can have a counter reasoning that doesn't arise to this context. Yeah, gosh, we finished earlier. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry, probably I'll just ask you to repeat some of the stuff you said yeah. because I'm not super sure I understood. Yeah. But so if the if the solution is to claim that therefore is a presupposition trigger and that blocks the, the regress, yeah. I just I mean that the first worry I'll have right away is Someone can ask you to justify a presupposition. You can assert things that presuppose others, and someone can be like, "Well, that's all good, but first convince me that what you're presupposing is is true otherwise." Right. And then, then the worry would be that that may trigger the regress. I'm sure you have a way to get around yeah. that. I just want to know. All right. That. So uh, I said that. Uh, so I said that premi uh, presuppositions are not uh, premises, and so right. uh, that's what makes them. Um, uh, not vulnerable to the regress. But well, they can be challenged. Right. Okay. Uh, so they, uh, so the, the way in which they can be challenged is different. Uh, so because you know there are challengeability tests, and uh, what makes a presupposition a presupposition is that um, you cannot challenge it directly. You can say wait a minute, and that's not a test for presupposition. Uh, but what is it? Um, I think what and that's that's the usual you know 
like you to say that, that that's not an issue, right? Mm -hmm. It's not an issue content. But what is important for me is particularly that uh, the presupposition can you 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 know you can really apply the rule to it. Um, so just to give you an example. Um, so Mary is coming to the party to So that presupposes that somebody else went to the party, right? So suppose that's so let's let's try it. Right? Somebody else, somebody. Else. So suppose this was a premise, right? You could use conjunction introduction, right? Sorry, I can barely read that. That's the. So no, that's not. <coughs> somebody else can to the party. Okay. That's what is presupposed, right? Now, it's not admissible to use conjunction introduction here, right? So, you say it's for the case that man is coming to the part two and somebody else is coming. Yeah. It's very weird, right? Yeah. So, that's what makes me think that this position are not premises, right? Because you cannot use rules uh, in, in the same way you would do for specific premises. So that the time is one to. So it's true that you can always, um, there's some way of challenging a presupposition where you say, wait a minute, right? Um, and so, uh, but that, you know, that's fine. That, that, you know, there's a way of challenging a presupposition where you're asking for your ground, you yeah. know, the reason why you're holding a presupposition. And in some, kind of, in some cases, you have to do that, right? Uh, but you won't get the regrets until your speaker will be willing to presuppose with you, willing to let you presuppose certain things. And the general maxim is. Right, that's see, the. Yeah. Because if he does, and then. Yeah. That's what the tortoise is doing now. The tortoise uh, keeps challenging uh, Achilles mm -hmm. and raises presupposition. <coughs> it, makes, it makes the presupposition come explicit, pre become explicit premises. And so that's what starts the regress. Okay? Right. So, if, if, so if, 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 if you're getting challenged in order to trigger the, the, the regress, first you have to grant that. Uh, what you said was felicitous, and then you have to grant the presupposition, yeah. and then there is no regress. Okay. Yeah. So good. yeah, I think uh, I give the right prediction since that if you are the, like the tortoise, you're going to challenge the presupposition, and you're led into the regress. And, you know, if you let that, let her do that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's it. It's a question about your final brief remarks about what yeah. distinguishes uh, yeah. causal transitions yes. between belief states yes. Yes. that count as, uh, as an inference and those that don't. Yeah. Did, did you say that what makes the difference is that uh, in those cases that count as inferences, uh, you are presupposing uh, certain things? That is, that, that the difference is uh, it's made so, by, by what is presupposed and what is. Yeah, so. Uh, take a causal transition between a belief A, A, and B, and B. So this is a causal transition, yeah. right? So let's suppose that these are belief states. Um, now, a causal transition like this um, doesn't need to be a piece of reasoning, right? Because um, I may hold the first two beliefs and be triggered by a you know, deviant chain to believe that B, that B, B right? Now, um, uh, some people want to say the difference between cause of transition and uh, reasoning is that in addition, uh, you believe, uh, you come to B by believing that if A and if A can B, then B. Right? Now, the problem is that that will start the regress, right? So you cannot do that. Right? Um, so, what's the other option? Well, uh, what about you get to B by presupposing that if A and if A and B, then B, right? And so, with the same kind of uh, um, the same strategy that let me uh, block the regress in the most like uh, obvious case, like the, the version, the standard version is one where the person actually uses the, the rule explicitly, right? And this is not what I've done. It doesn't need to be. I don't need to invoke a specific <coughs> correspondence to get to P, right? But you still need to presuppose that the premises will enter the conclusion. You might, that's my. So this is not entirely new because, um, for example, John Broom thought that what distinguishes causal transition from a reasoning is that uh, you have an implicit 
linking belief, right? But an implicit linking belief for him has to be unconscious, right? And I think that's incorrect because, um, you know, uh, for example, in the logic teacher case, is explicitly invoking the rule, so you know, is explicitly entertaining the rule, um, and uh, that's uh, that's good for me because presupposition can be intentionally presupposed. I can intentionally and you know be aware of the presupposition when I do. They, they don't need to be tacit. So I think my view improves in the kind of strategy that we have here. Okay, so my question was simply that I was wondering if, yeah. you, if, you, mean, if you mean my account of yeah. what the difference consisting makes justice or, or not yeah. to the very um, intuitive thought that uh, what makes a difference is that in um, cases of, in general cases of, in, in general cases of inference, uh, the transition is attributable to you. As an agent, it's something that you are doing or performing, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, in the other cases, it is not attributable to you; it's triggered by something else. Yeah, that's also a good feature of yeah. So I think uh, I, I get that intuitive uh, idea that active reason is something that you do because presupposing is something that you do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So. Um, I guess I have a question about how uh, tied to natural language this is. Yeah. Because I would have thought that the Carol lesson was not about language. Yeah. Um, it was about uh, inference. Um, yeah. And so I, I just sort of imagined, you, you know, logical languages don't have presupposition, at least as like a semantic feature of those. You, you might, I mean, yeah. I don't know, we can... I disagree with that, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so uh, good. Um, so, uh, Daniel is asking, well, suppose, you know, uh, really the, the inference rule, uh, modus ponens, um, is this thing, right? In this schema, where you have the horizontal line, right? Um, and you may ask, um, uh, what does that have to do with the rule? Okay, so uh, a few things. Uh, first of all, um, I think it's plausible that uh, the four translates in, instant, in, in English. Um, what we would use in the Latin logic uh, as the, the meaning of the horizontal line, right? You will still ask, you know, logic makes sense to ask syntactically um, how do you interpret that? I mean, people don't do that, right? But you still want to ask why is this different from, why is this schema different from uh, the logical truth, right? The, the um, conditional schema, uh, yeah, conditional schema. Why is it different? It must be because this has a different meaning from, from that, right? Uh, and I'm saying, well, the clauses we have in English to express that meaning is therefore. Right? It's the clauses. It's not quite perfect as much because the four takes, um, the four doesn't take, at least it seems to me, it doesn't take premises that are not discharged. Um, so, for example, if you say, if it's raining, uh, therefore, it's wet, it's kind of weird, people don't like that, when embedded in conditional. So, uh, that suggests to me that maybe, therefore, it's a kind of more similar to the square mm. that you have uh, the, in the theorems, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I want to say that uh, therefore is the closest thing that we have to horizontal line. And so, um, nobody ever tries to give a semantic for this, but I think it makes sense to ask what uh, is that, you know, what is it doing? You can ask about the syntax of it, right? It's a, it takes two premises and a conclusion into an argument, so you must be able to ask for the semantics as well, right? And I think that semantics is what, and very similar to what we need in So you're right, that, yeah. Uh, is that all, or you want to? Well, that's very helpful, but so, like, I guess what I'm wondering is imagine you can write, you can imagine, like, a sort of logical language where you don't have a bar or a box, you have our sort of, you know, parentheses after new lines you add, and then you say what justified them, right? I guess this is just like uh, to ask, like, have you said? Like, I, I agreed with your question, like that when you were saying you're dissatisfied with like the rule, um, like truth distinction, and I'm wondering, well, you still write those in, in the system I'm imagining now. You just write parentheses like one, two, and p or something, and I'm wondering like what your what cor like what have you said that corresponds? Like, have you analyzed that distinction just in, in other terms? The rule, uh, truth distinction. 
is it, you see what I'm saying? Like, suppose we don't have a line, it's just like, yeah, like it's just different types of, th types of things that you might put after the line that you add. Does that make any sense? I mean, yeah. To, if you want to represent it all, you'll have to find some symbol that you know maps the difference between row level and two, right? So when you uh, state the rule, the schema will have the line. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and I mean, semantically, I mean, the semantically they will uh, uh, be different because in what case it will be a function that take uh, that takes a uh, you know maybe and it's a little bit controversial context uh, premises and conclusion uh, into uh, soundness and cosiness. Uh, Provided a set of propositions satisfied, in the other case will be, uh, you know, maybe a such proposition something that uh, correspond. Yeah, that's true of course. But you know, in general, you know, it's true that we don't want to do other language wrong here. But I mean, it seems plausible that therefore expresses in English whatever mechanism is underlying your reasoning when you do it in your mind and your logic. Any other questions? If not, I'll call on the so there's, sorry, anyone else? Yeah. So there's one thing that kind of bothers me, which is, it seems to be, I mean, I, I like what you do with the level of language, super happy, especially with what you replied to Ricardo, um, because it just doesn't seem to be felicitous if you introduce the presupposition. There doesn't seem to be something analogous in the case of beliefs. I mean, you turn and you say, I want to do the same sort of, story there, and you can appeal and say, well, just give me a nice unified story of the whole phenomenon. Yeah. But then it seems that language is taking, what we do in natural language is taking a, a, you know, a prominent role, because it's dictating what you can do at the level of mind. And that doesn't necessarily match up. I mean, we, we have, there is a tendency yeah. to go in that direction. So is there anything analogous that you can say that, besides saying what solves a problem, but you know, that might be all you want to say, but that, that, that sort of is the same sort of blocking of saying, well, no, what well, you presuppose, you can't put it into the, as a premise, especially because of what, you, what I thought you were saying. I mean, if you presuppose something, you can have some sort of implicit, you know, implicit belief, but in your case, you said, no, it could be explicit. So uh, well, it depends what you mean with this implicit. So uh, I'm happy to call it implicit. Uh, hmm. But what's important to me is that um, it doesn't need to be uh, unconscious. Right? That's fine. That's okay. I, that's, yeah. I'm happy with that. But the point is that because it doesn't need to be unconscious, then what stops it from in, including it as, as a premise? We don't seem to have the same sort of strong reason that right. we seem to have from language. Yeah, so, uh, so it's true that uh, presupposition is a linguistic category, right? Um, but... Uh, you know, you know the, the, the general idea. I mean, you presuppose it's just a mental act, right? But you can express in English, you know, by using the presupposition trigger. But you know, it doesn't seem to me um, implausible to think that you know, also for Sonak, ultimately, is a mental act, right? <laughs> they used to do it, you know, because it's pragmatic, right? And they involve sorts of intentions and uh, the yeah. speaker, right? Um, so yeah, I what's mutually known. Yeah, what's mutually known. So that's you know, I, I want to say that it's true that especially uh, I'm talking about semantic presupposition. So I think I'm particularly liable to the kind of concern that you're voicing. Um, because I have to give a pretty uh, rigid principle between semantic presupposition and the kind of presupposition that you may use in reason. Yeah. Right? But it's gonna be a rigid principle between pragmatic presupposition and semantic presupposition. And uh, maybe in the case of uh, you know mental uh, mental reasoning, um, because there's no expression here, there's an implicit you know horizontal line. What we're doing is mentally presupposing that you know, that's what really matters the, the, the reasoning uh, when it comes to you know, mental acts. Mm -hmm. to. We don't use a word. Uh, that's true. Uh, yeah, it just seemed to me that there was that was dominant. What was dominating was language and that. Um, Criteria or reasons that we have in language for But yeah, I, can, I can express this reasoning with an argument in English, yeah. and I'm going to use that. So somewhere I'm translating from a mental case yeah. to the form. So there must be something that I'm yeah. translating. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Anyone else? Um, okay. 
Well, thank you very thank much, Carlotta. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, the original title of my talk is Questioning Presupposition Failure. <laughs> and the thing is, I've been struggling with this problem. I will, I've been trying to solve this, this philosophical problem for a while. And I thought that the, so the solution had to be coached in terms of questions under discussion, and that then I had to say something funny about presupposition failure and all that. I, I even taught a, a seminar on that. There are a few of my students. Uh, and then two days ago, as I was writing the handout, I realized that it doesn't work. Uh, so what you'll see today is my newest attempt to solve the problem. Uh, it's not a mature view, but I think it's plausible. I, I like it. Um, so, uh, there we go. I'm not going to be questioning your position either, so... Mm -hmm. Alright, so, um, of course, the structure of the talk is this. Uh, I'm going to try to convince you that a theory of linguistic communication that I like a lot has a problem. It claims uh, a certain thing that it's very important from the perspective of the theory, and I'll try to convince you that that thing is false. And then I'll try to fix the problem without uh, changing the theory too much, uh, without having to sacrifice many of the things that make this theory attractive. Uh, so that's the structure. Okay, so if you're a philosopher thinking about linguistic communication, uh, you'll find yourself thinking a lot about certain relations between semantic properties of the sentences we use to communicate, and our mental states. And you know, that's fairly obvious because when you can when you communicate by way of using language, what you want to do is affect the minds of your interlocutors in certain ways, right? You want to make them believe certain things, or you want to to trigger some, some linguistic responses by having certain mental attitudes, you want them to ask certain questions. So of course you want to choose your sentence uh, carefully so that you can achieve these effects in the minds of your interlocutors. So, um, of course, the relations between semantic properties and our mental states are super important from the perspective of a theory of linguistic communication. And I want to focus on a particular relation of that kind uh, now. So, uh, I'm going to give you a bunch of, of, of background so that you can understand the semantic facts that I want to talk about and the mental properties I want to talk about. And then um, I will state the, this thing that the theory that I like uh, says and that I believe it's false. All right, so there, is, um, there are semantic presuppositions, right? And that's a property of, of sentences. So we say that uh, P semantically presupposes Q if and only if the truth of, of um, sorry, that should be P, the truth of P is, re no, sorry. If and only if the truth of, of Q is required for the truth of, of P. So if P semantically presupposes Q, and if Q is not true, then P cannot be true, but it can also be, it cannot be false either. So for P to be true or false, Q has to be true. So here is a standard example. The sentence, the king of France is bold, semantically presupposes that there is a king of France. So if it's false that there's a king of France, then the sentence, the king of France is bold, cannot be true, cannot be false, right? Uh, another common example is mm, the sentence, I have to pick up my sister from the airport, presupposes that I have a sister, semantically presupposes, because if it's false that I have a sister, then the sentence, I have to pick up my sister from the airport, isn't, cannot be true, cannot be false. Um, okay. Mm. Now, um, there is this other notion of presupposition. Uh, I'm going to just call it speaker presupposition. And that's a relation between a uh, proposition and uh, a person. So, one can give a very technical definition of this notion, but I'm, I'm just going to simplify things and offer a simplified version that is uh, quite enough for my purposes. So, uh, we say that S presupposes P, in this pragmatic sense, um, just in case S takes P for granted. Uh, so, in a sense, we're having a conversation now, and there's a bunch of things that we all take for granted. 
For example, we all take for granted that we live in, that we are now in Mexico City, right? So that's that's a proposition that we all uh, pragmatically presuppose in this conversation. Okay, uh, we all presuppose that we're human beings. Uh, that uh, this is a philosophy conference, and many many things. There are all these propositions that we take for granted in this particular conversation. In any conversation, you presuppose a lot of things. Uh, depending on the conversation, you will presuppose one thing or another. All right. So, given this notion of pick up presupposition, we can um, define a notion of common ground. So, in a conversation, all the participants to a conversation will presuppose a bunch of things. Um, uh, take all those presuppositions, all those propositions that are presupposed by all of the participants to a conversation. We are going to call that the common ground. It's the body of information that we take for granted. I'm simplifying things a bit, but in an innocent way, I hope. All right, so the common ground right away determines a set of possible worlds. Uh, so those are the, all the worlds that are compatible with everything that we presuppose, right? So um, in this conversation, we all presuppose that we're in Mexico City, and that what, we, that what that means is that every world in, in the context set is going to be such that we're in Mexico City, right? Uh, but we don't presuppose anything about whether I have a sister or not. Uh, many of you don't really know me, you don't know whether I have a sister, so we're not taking for granted the proposition that I have a sister. So what that means is that there are going to be worlds in the context set where I have a sister, but there are worlds in the context set where I don't have a sister because both kinds of worlds are compatible with everything that we take for granted. Okay. And then in a conversation, what we want to do is to figure out which one of these worlds is our world. We want to know whether we live in a world, let's say, where I have a sister, or whether we live in a world where I don't have a sister. So if I assert, hey guys, I have a sister, now we'll come to, to presuppose that I have a sister, and that what means is that uh, we're going to rule out from the context set all the worlds where I don't have a sister, and then the body of information that we take for granted is one where the information that I have a sister is entailed. And now we know that we live in a world where I have a sister. Right? So that's the model of linguistic communication I'll be uh, working with. And uh, with these tools we can define a notion of pragmatic presupposition for sentences. So, uh, the pragmatic presuppositions of a sentence P uh, impose certain conditions on the context set, on the body of information that we take for granted. Um, so, what kind of requirements? Uh, so, let's say that P pragmatically presupposes Q. If this is the case, then the participants of the conversation must take for granted Q before they update the context set with P. <coughs> so, the idea is that if the sentence, if the, if the sentence uh, I have to pick up my sister from the airport pragmatically presupposes that I have a sister, then if I'm, if I'm to assert the first thing, then it has to be the case that this body of information already satisfies the proposition that I have a sister. And in that sense, it pragmatically presupposes that I have a sister, right? It's, it imposes certain conditions on um, on the things we take for granted, and therefore our minds, in some, in some, in some sense or, or another, right? So, all right, um, um, so in a sense, semantic presuppositions impose definiteness conditions uh, on sentences, in the sense that if a given sentence is to be true or false, is to be defined relative to a circumstance of evaluation, relative to a world, then uh, there is this condition that it has to be satisfied. The semantic presupposition has to be true. Right? Whereas pragmatic presuppositions impose felicity conditions. If you are to say something felicitous in a conversation, something that is fine from the perspective of linguistic rules, then the body of information we'll take for granted has to satisfy uh, certain constraints. It has to entail the pragmatic presupposition of a sentence or a term, right? So then, uh, it seems like these two things, semantic and pragmatic presuppositions, uh, 
are in some way dependent. And uh, that's the relation between semantic properties and our minds that I'm, I want to focus on. So, um, um, some people, especially Stonaker in his famous assertion paper, uh, he, he, uh, he put forward this uh, bridge principle, which is a principle that it's supposed to explain certain regularities between semantic and pragmatic presuppositions. So if you turn the page, you'll see the bridge principle. I'm going to use uh, von Fintel's formulation of the principle, but it's equivalent to Stoddaker's. Uh, what the bridge principle says is the following. <clears throat> Partial or three-value propositions can... Sorry, so, all right, a bit more of background. Um, so, in this theory, I have to pick up my sister from the airport. Is the kind of thing that can be true, can be false, or can have a stigmatized truth value. Can be either undefined, or you can assign like one half, or something like that. Some intermediate uh, value, right? So the bridge principle says partial or three value propositions can only be used to update a context set, this body of information. If all worlds compatible with that context set are such that the proposition gives a non stigmatized truth value to them. So, if it gives either true or false. Uh, so, the idea is, if I'm going to assert uh, the sentence, I have to pick up my sister from the airport relative to this body of information, <laughs> the bridge principle says, you can only update this body of information with that, with, that, with that assertion if that sentence is either true or false relative to every world in the context set. But of course, what that means is that if in this particular conversation we don't take for granted that I have a sister, then there are going to be some worlds in the context set where I have a sister and others where I don't. Now focus on those worlds where I don't have a sister. If we evaluate the, 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 the sentence, I have to pick up my sister from the airport relative to that world, uh, then the semantic presupposition is not satisfied, because relative to this world is false that I have a sister, and then the sentence or the proposition that the sentence expresses is not true, is not false, is neither true or false. It has a stigmatized truth value. So what that principle says is don't do that. So then, uh, in practice, what that means is that if, if you're going to assert a, a sentence with certain semantic presupposition, this principle uh, implies that this body of information has to entail the proposition. But that's just to say that the pragmatic presupposition uh, of my sister has to be <coughs> sorry, I have to pick up my sister from the airport, has to be satisfied, has to be true in all the worlds in this context. So that's the particular relation between semantic properties and our minds that I, um, that I want to focus on. So, you know, it seems like a plausible principle. Stanaker justifies it by saying, look, if you say something that doesn't have a truth value, true or false relative to one of these worlds, then that the participants of the conversation won't know how to update this body of information. That's why there is this rule that says, don't do that. And that turns out to, to draw this connection between semantic and pragmatic presupposition. But uh, I think there is something wrong with this principle, and is that my suspicion is that Stoddard formulated the principle without taking into account some, some notable semantic facts that are related to stigmatized truth value, and that's, that's the phenomenon of, vague, of vagueness. So, um, a vague predicate is, is a predicate like x is tall, and I obviously don't have time to say a whole lot about vagueness, but the intuitive idea is this. Imagine a series <laughs> of, of people. The first one is uh, super tall, the last one is very short. There is only one millimeter difference between each adjacent mem members. So it's a progressive, a smooth uh, progression from the tall to the not tall. If I were to say to you, the tall ones look very nice, then um, I will be using the predicate is tall to, do, to draw certain uh, classifications. So I will be saying about these guys that are nice, I won't be saying about these guys that are nice, but I, there is this region of indeterminacy where there is not, it is, it's not semantically determined whether I'm classifying these, these people as tall or not tall. Not everyone agrees with this, this way of setting up the phenomenon, but um, I do, so there you go. Um, all right, so 
How is this relevant for questioning the bridge principle? Imagine, and this is, this is my toy example, I use it for different purposes, but it also works for this. So, um, imagine we're in New York City, we don't presuppose anything about the location of Jerry Fowler's apartment, we're looking for it, we want to know where Jerry Fowler's live. So, even that we don't presuppose anything about the location of Fowler's apartment, there's going to be a world in the context set where the apartment is right by the Met, the Metropolitan Opera House, there's going to be an apartment that is a bit farther away, uh, uh, sorry, another world where the apartment is a bit farther away, there's going to be another world where the apartment is a bit farther away, and so on. So you're going to have a series like this one, but for the predicate, is near the Met. And let's say someone asserts Fuller's apartment is near the Met. Well, that seems like a perfectly, perfectly good informative assertion. Now we know that Fuller's apartment is near the Met. But of course, this sentence is not going to it's, gonna, it's not going to be either true or false relative to every world in the context. Look at the world where the apartment is kind of close, but not really, it's, it's, it's a bit far, it's just not determined whether it's close to the Met. Relative to that world, what I asserted is neither true nor false. That seems to violate the bridge principle, but yet there seems to be nothing wrong with this assertion. It seems to be perfectly fine. So that's, that's a good reason to believe that the bridge principle is false. I have what, like, three seconds? <laughs> no, you have like three minutes, I'll give you four. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because um, the was quick. Um, right, so now I'm just going to spend some time trying to offer an alternative to the bridge principle that doesn't have this problem and uh, that doesn't require uh, much of the power from from this theory of linguistic communication that I like. Okay, so of course, what we have to do is, is just take the phenomenon of vagueness into account and then formulate a principle that even though allows us to say things are indeterminate relative to the context that because of vagueness, it still uh, says that there is something wrong to say something that is indeterminate uh, relative to the context of because of uh, the presuppositions of the sentence being asserted not being satisfied by this body of information. So, um, so I, I'm just going to use some of the insights uh, that supervaluationism gives us. I I have my research about supervaluationism, but I think it gets enough right about the phenomenon of vagueness, so I can use that theory for the purposes of this stuff. So, all right, so. In this theory, how we model a proposition is as a set of possible worlds. So the proposition expressed by snow is white is just the set, of, the set of all possible worlds where that proposition is true. The proposition expressed by Ricardo is tall is the set of all possible worlds where, where Ricardo is, is tall. Right? So then how do we take vagueness into account in this kind of theory? Well, rather than modeling the meaning of a sentence, the proposition expressed by a sentence, sorry, uh, just as a set of possible worlds, we can model it as a set of sets of possible worlds. So it will be a set of many propositions. Each of these propositions is, is meant to be compatible with everything that is determined about the meaning of the sentence in question. Uh, so if you know supervaluationism, you can think of these propositions as analogous to admissible specifications, right? So think of the proposition, Ricardo Stoll, well, that's, that's vague. Uh, so we're going to understand this proposition as a set of, that contains a one set of possible worlds, uh, precise possible worlds that are compatible with everything that is determined by the meaning of Ricardo and Stoll, and then a different set that is also a specification, uh, slightly different. So the idea would be, um, that, of course, there's going to be a lot of overlap between uh, these propositions. So, think of the world where I'm as tall as I am, 197. So, uh, both, that world is going to be in the overlap of these precise propositions, because given the meaning of Ricardo and tall, it's determined that if I'm, if I'm as tall as I am, uh, I'm, I'm going to be definitely tall. So, that world is going to be on the overlap of all the propositions. But now think of the worlds where I'm like 177. 
Well, it's kind of indeterminate whether someone that is 977 is tall, so that world is going to be a member of, of some of those propositions, but, but not all. And that's what it means to be indeterminate uh, in this kind of model. The proposition would be indeterminate relative to this world. All right. But now, of course, the context set is this little guy. Uh, a way of thinking about it is just as the conjunction of all, of all the things we presuppose. And that itself is a, a proposition, sorry. And so we can model the context set in exactly the same way as, as a set of set of possible words. I know I'm going too fast, sorry, I don't have time to explain things in more detail. So I'm about to, st to state the solution. And I'm sorry if it, it feels a bit artificial, I can, I can uh, say more during Q&A. Um, um, okay, uh, so go to page 3, there is uh, this bridge principle in, in bold letters. Uh, so here you go. Um, sorry, let me just represent the context set. Um, <laughs> I just have to read one sentence and pretend this is perfectly clear. So the context set is also this set of, set of possible worlds. And we say that a proposition P, either vague or not, can only be used to update a context set C if each world in W, so if each world in the context set, is such that there is a precisification of the proposition we're asserting, uh, such that that precisification is either true or false relative to that world, for each world. So what this gives you, <laughs> sorry, it's the now, well, we'll eat, a, eat a little bit into your discussion time and just. Yeah, all right. So what this means is, um, what this means is, is the following. Um, you can, you can assert something that is indeterminate relative to the context set due to vagueness. So, Fodor's apartment is near the man is going to be indeterminate relative to the world where the apartment is kind of close, kind of far. And that's because some of the precisifications of what you're saying are going to be true relative to that world, but some of them are going to be false. Right? However, the, the Greek principle doesn't condone those assertions. Because relative to that world, there is going to be at least one precisification where uh, that is going to be either true or false relative to that world. But notice that if, an, if it's an instance of presupposition failure, then uh, uh, let's go back to the example I have to pick up my sister from the airport. There is going to be a world where I don't have a sister, so the assertion is neither true nor false relative to that world. Right? So now think of this model. Uh, does would this assertion satisfy the bridge principle? The answer is no, because for every world in the context set of this body of information that we take for granted, sorry, for some of those worlds, the worlds where I don't have a sister, it's going to be false that there is at least one precisification of I, ha I have to pick up my sister from the airport that is either true or false relative to that world, simply because all the precisifications of I have to pick up my sister from the airport are going to be such that they are indeterminate relative to a world where I don't have a sister. So whereas this rich principle allows to assert sentences that are indeterminate due to vagueness, it doesn't allow to assert sentences that are indeterminate uh, because of presupposition failure. So there you go, that, that's all the, the problem. Um, Thank you. Yeah, cool. So this went by fast for me, so if this is a naive question, I'm sorry. Um, so I was wondering how you would deal with higher order vagueness. Um, because, you know, if you just go up one order, mm -hmm. it, it, this looks nice to me, it really, I think it solves it. But, yeah. Um, <coughs> does it ramify? Uh, yeah, I mean, my suspicion is that I will have to treat higher order vagueness as, as um, as a super evolutionist would. So is, is your worry that if I assert something like it's determinate that Fodor's apartment is near the map, that may violate the bridge principle? Uh, yeah, something like that. Or it just, uh, I guess what I was thinking is just, uh, it could be compatible, right? So I guess what I was thinking is it could be compatible 
whether a context set that it is and is not. Um, they, both things are. And so then I'm just wondering like, how your context sets would model that. Sorry, can you give a concrete example of how a context set will allow for things being and not being better? Yeah, where, like, where it might be, like, there will be some worlds in which like, uh, it's vague where uh, uh, if voter lives such and such distance from the net, that it's uh, that, it, that it's near it, mm. and somewhere uh, it won't be um, big if he lives such and such. Huh. So you think that maybe there are some specifications of the context that where it's vague that that the that, that the sentence false or is near the vague that the net is vague and some specification relative to which is not. Yeah, the context set might be very undecided about um, mm. what should count as a borderline case of, of nearness. Right. So, uh, excellent question. I haven't thought about it. My suspicion is that the assertion would still satisfy the bridge principle, right? Because in relative to the fraction of the context that where it's vague, whether it's false or permanent near the net, uh, the bridge principle is going to be satisfied because for each world in the context set, there's going to be at least one specification of the sentence, false or permanent near the net, that is going to be the true or false relative to it. And of course, the same can be said about the bit of the context set where it's perfect. The sentence "false or permanent zero the net" is perfectly precise. It's going to be even yeah. uh, more clear there. In a way, I guess this is just a modeling question. Like, um, the con it seems like as you have the context sets now, I don't know how to represent that kind of like openness about what's vague. Right. right. Um, and I'm just wondering, well, is there a regress? That we should be worried about here, that you're going to have to like make context sets, sets, of sets, of sets, of sets, of sets of worlds. So. Uh, maybe. I mean, I haven't thought about how to exactly model higher order vagueness here. Sure. Uh, but if, if if this is how I model first order vagueness, then it looks like I may have to I may have to do something like that. But yeah, I mean, I would be <coughs> maybe happy about, about that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, <coughs> thank you very much, Ray, for belonging to your discussion. Okay, so yeah, that's, the, that's the topic natural kind of nouns and the problem of arbitrators. I will be explaining what that is. Um, so here is the, here's the, the list of topics of the talk. Uh, this is about the the Kripke Putnam picture of reference fixing and uh, of the reference fixed for ordinary natural time terms. Uh, I suppose that's uh, more or less familiar. The basis of that is familiar for most people here. Uh, nevertheless, I will be explaining or uh, summarizing what they say about this. Mm. Then I will be talking about one of the challenges to the Kripke Putnam picture, which is what I, I don't think it has a standard name in the literature, but I, I will be calling this uh, arbitrariness problems. And I will be explaining what that is. Uh, and then <coughs> at the end, I will, if I have time, I will be talking about how some version of the Kripke Pandem picture might deal with arbitrariness problems. So this is the, the schema of the, of the talk. Okay. Ahí donde dice 72% se aumenta. Sí, pero tengo que subirla. In the menu, it's actually the green dot to the uh, oh, thank you. Left. I could, it's because I can't. Mm -hmm. this, yeah. oh. Thank you for the view. <laughs> okay, I suppose this will be familiar to many people here. Both Kripke and Pandam postulate two ways a natural kind of noun can come to refer. Uh, for one way would be this a typical normal speaker who will often have had no direct contact with sulfur, inherits her apparent capacity to refer to sulfur with the name sulfur from other speakers whose uses of sulfur she has heard of or seen, at least if she intends to use it with the same reference as those speakers. So here we have the case of 
someone who hasn't seen uh, sulfur or any samples of sulfur, but she receives the name from other speakers in a causal transmission of the, of the name or the noun. And if everything goes right, he or uh, she thereby becomes uh, a competent user of, uh, of sulfur. But then there would be, uh, not everybody can be like this, and there would be individuals with hands-on experience with sulfur, people who have seen sulfur, including the first people who began to use the term. And this, the, the picture says, developed the intention to refer with sulfur to uh, something like this, the substance of which all or most of these are examples pointing or intending to refer to some examples of sulfur. Or equivalently, the intention to call sulfur any sample of the same substance as the paradigmatic suspected instances, these things that um, people are seeing or they are, that they have in mind. Uh, nouns for more familiar ordinary natural kinds, such as water, will for typical speakers fall under the second way. So everybody has seen some water or nearly everybody. Um, similar things will, will uh, be postulated by Kripke and Pan about uh, uh, species terms, uh, ordinary species terms, and for uh, natural phenomena terms. Now, I think it's important to separate this thesis about uh, how reference is fixed, about uh, reference fixing, or the, the, the mechanism of reference fixing, from a different part of the Kripke Pandem picture which is their adoption of certain specific views about uh, the nature of the reference of the of at least many natural uh, uh, nouns for natural substances and biological kinds and phenomena. So for example, both Kripke and Pandem adopt the specific view that modern chemistry has shown that water is identical with H2O. That something is water if and only if it is H2O. Putnam, at least, uh, I'm not so sure about Kripke here, accepts that modern biochemistry has shown that the lemon trees are the plants with a certain appropriately specified genetic code. And in the case of gold, the noun gold, both Kripke and Putnam accept that modern chemistry has shown gold to be uh, the element with atomic number 79. Uh, so, something I want to uh, stress is that. Uh, it is conceivable that uh, they are mistaken in their belief, even though it is uh, a belief partly shared by the scientific community at large, that modern chemistry has shown the reference of the ordinary world were to be H2O. And yet, that the reference fixing mechanism that they postulate, or some refined version, does deliver some other reference. It, it is at work somehow. But the, the reference that the mechanism determines is something else. And my impression is that this is actually the, the true situation. Uh, now we come to arbitrary objections. So far, everything I suppose is more or less familiar. And this, uh, this would be the, the things I call arbitrary objections from uh, recent literature in the philosophy of chemistry, uh, also in the philosophy of biology, there are similar things. Uh, ortho water, what, what's this? In ortho water, this is H2O, uh, but such that the spins of the protons in the hydrogen atoms uh, are parallel. Well, in para water, they are not. Uh, it turns out that paradigmatic water has a 3 to 1 ratio of ortho water to para water. But they can be separated by physical means. Uh, each of them returns to the 3 to 1 ratio after a while. But it is conceivable that under appropriate circumstances, of water or power of water should uh, stay, stay stable as such. Um, so, in view of this phenomenon, uh, or this truth about uh, H2O and the paradigms of water, what determines whether a certain sample is one of the same substance as some paradigms of water? Is a certain sample of the same substance as the paradigms of water when it is in the 3 to 1 ratio of earth water to power water? Uh, 
when it is composed of oil for water and power water, in some other uh, possibly some other ratio, when it is composed of oil for water or power water, uh, it seems as if it's not clear or, or, or as if it is plainly arbitrary how we should answer this, these questions. And if they cannot be answered in a principled way, the Kripke Padna mechanism is not singling out any substance as the reference of what That would be one objection uh, of this kind. Here's another, which perhaps it's easier to visualize. We'll know that elements come in different isotopes depending on the number of neutrons in the nucleus. The most common isotope of hydrogen, protein, has atoms with just one proton and no neutrons in the nucleus. While another of the isotopes, deuterium, has atoms with one neutron besides the proton. And there are isotopic variations of H2O corresponding to these isotopes. Protium oxide is P2O. This is H2O where the hydrogen atoms are protium atoms. So atoms with uh, just one proton and no neutrons. And deuterium oxide, D2O, is H2O where the hydrogen atoms are deuterium atoms with uh, one neutron besides the proton. And it turns out that paradigmatic water is basically composed of P2O, uh, but contains extremely small amounts of uh, deuterium <coughs> oxide. Here again we can ask, is there a principal reason why water should be identified with H2O, as it's normally done, uh, instead of with P2O? Is there a principal reason why D2O instances are or are not the same substance as alleged paradigms of water, given that uh, paradigms are basically P2O? And even though P2O is H2O. So the, the critics of the, of the creepy pattern picture suggest that there is no uh, such reason that can arise from the creepy pattern story from the uh, mechanism of reference fixing from this um, initial slide. And in particular, the key here is um, the development of the intention to refer with water to the substance of which all or most of these are examples. This intention wouldn't be sufficient to uh, pick out one of these uh, substances, um, in some sense of substance, uh, B2O, D2O, uh, one from, from among all of them, one of them as the, the single substance that, that is referred to by, by water. So this is a problem from, for the Kripke Padnam uh, story, because it would seem that uh, if the mechanism uh, of reference fixing that the, that the story postulates doesn't single out a particular substance, then uh, then assuming that the, that the mechanism is the mechanism that is really at work, which is something that is not being questioned really by these critics, we would have uh, the situation that these terms for ordinary substances are not, uh, don't have a reference. And this would be um, certainly undesirable if for no other reason, because it would seem that they should have a reference. Water is something, uh, it should be something. We are talking about something when we talk about water, it would seem. But then what, what is it? Um, of course, the, um, the story may be, may be wrong at the level of the, um, of the uh, basic picture of how reference is fixed, but I insist that this is not really questioned by the critics for some reason. It seems to, to them, or it appears to seem to them that, uh, that the picture is basically right, but then if it is basically right, then there is this, this problem of arbitrariness. Now, is it, is it the right picture uh, of reference fixing for natural kind terms? 
I agree with these critics that the the picture it sounds as if it's basically right. Uh, I I have my own picture which I see as a refinement of this uh, the Greek Republican picture, and uh, in particular. Mm, the refinement is basically that, uh, in my view, the um, the conventions that uh, fix uh, reference for uh, natural kind nouns and for other kinds of uh, expressions, including proper names and demonstratives, are conventions uh, which state in precise, roughly sufficient conditions for, in this case, natural kind noun reference, reference failure and successful transmission. But uh, in essence, um, this is the Kripke Pandan picture, as I say there, seen under a magnifying lens uh, and with some uh, modifications which are not really, uh, doesn't, don't strike me as really uh, very uh, substantive as applied to this particular case of the consideration of the arbitrary astronomers. Mm -hmm. um, so, this, these are problems that should worry me, uh, given what I've uh, done elsewhere. And that's why I'm interested in, in this. Um, implications of any appropriate picture. Mm. Whatever the right picture, I think the picture is going to uh, rely on the fact that uh, in, in this referential intentions, which play the, the basic role in fixing reference, some ordinary concepts are going to appear. And in particular, in, in this case, concepts of substance, species, and phenomenon are going to be involved. Also, the, the concept of exemplification, of being a case or example, and also the introduced concepts for particular substances, species, and phenomena. Uh, this must have some, some content, uh, some ordinary content, and they must have some a priori connections with other concepts, which surely must play a role in the determination of uh, the things that are satisfied by these intentions. So this is something I want to call attention to. And also, I think that um, uh, this is uh, another way of saying it, perhaps more precise. Any appropriate picture should respect the idea, which is basically Kripkean, that the development of appropriate intentions to refer with water, say, to the substance satisfying such and such conditions, does establish at the very least a priori connections between water and descriptions of this form. And therefore, a priori connections between water and the concept of substance and other concepts, any substance that appears here in the descriptions, uh, uh, which appear in the, in the reference fixing intentions. So my, in my uh, idea, my hypothesis, is that these contents and connections uh, are going to play a decisive role. Only five minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> going to play a decisive role in constraining the field of candidates for reference. Um, I think that much of the, of the force of the arbitrariness of objections comes from presuppositions that the uh, objectors or the critics see as essential parts of the Kripke pattern picture. And here is a, a summary of some of the things that uh, uh, the critics see as essential. Uh, that there are scientifically discoverable, necessary and sufficient conditions for belonging to a natural kind. That these necessary and sufficient conditions, scientifically, uh, scientific uh, necessary and sufficient conditions, insist in a specification of the kind's hidden underlying structure. Here the, the key word is structure, here is scientifically discovered. And another, another um, feature, membership in these kinds ought to be close to an all or nothing matter. Real kinds should have sharp boundaries. This is all from a uh, paper by Sarah Jane Nesco. Uh, but I think that these are not an essential part, or in some cases even a part, of the Kripke and Palm accounts. Um, why? 
it's a question, as I say, of what is included in the ordinary uh, pre-scientific meanings of substance, uh, species, and phenomena. Uh, the question is, is it required by the ordinary meanings of substance and water, for example, that water must be, if it is anything, a substance specifiable in terms of scientifically discovered necessary and sufficient conditions? I think that the, the answer to uh, all the questions about whether uh, water satisfies all these features is clearly no. Uh, the meaning of substance involves no requirement that a substance be characterized by a scientific mind, for example. And uh, similarly, it's not part of the ordinary meaning of substance or species that uh, there should be um, scientific necessary and sufficient conditions consisting in the possession of hidden underlying structures for possession, for um, uh, membership in these kinds. Um, so, for example, to, to illustrate this, um, it's natural to suppose that it's part of the meaning of uh, species, that species must have a certain nature of essence. I don't, I don't deny that. That's uh, pretty clear to me. But I don't think that it's part of the meaning of species, and analogously for, for substance, uh, that the characterization is, should be given in terms of uh, necessary and sufficient conditions consisting in the possession of a scientifically specified underlying structure. Something that illustrates this. Uh, it was generally thought that living beings had a crucial characteristic, life, which was not reducible to scientific conditions. But presumably, vitalist people who said this did not have my, uh, non ordinary meaning for species and, and tiger. So they had have, they have probably this, the same concept of uh, tiger as the rest of us, but um, not for this reason. They, they, they had this um, assumption in mind that uh, the essence of the tiger should be given scientifically. Uh, also, I think it's pretty clear that it's not part of the ordinary meaning of, sub or of substance and water that they should have shared boundaries. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons why I think this is um, basically the, the reasoning or the intuitions behind the arbitrariness arguments that I presented. There is no principal reason the critics note why water should be identified with H2O instead of with P2O. No principal reason why D2O should or should not be the same substance as the as alleged paradigms of water. Um, but if this is so, water has blurry boundaries, or vague boundaries along dimensions along which H2O does not. And this is something that must be due to the means of substance and water. Or uh, principles that govern the meaning of water when, it, when this is introduced as a, a natural kind noun. So I think actually if you make a kind of guest out switch, uh, you can see these arbitrary arguments as arguments for the uh, thesis that uh, natural kind, ordinary natural kind nouns like water actually don't have uh, shared boundaries. And this is part of the, of the ordinary meaning of these things. So this will be the, the last slide, uh, given the, the time constraints. Uh, even if we grant that arbitrariness objections show that a creepy Putnam mechanism of reference fixing cannot determine, let's say, the reference of where is H2O instead of P2O, or vice versa, these objections cannot show that the reference of where is not some vague natural kind, irreducible to precise structural scientific kinds, some ordinary natural kind, as we might call it. This is something that is allowed by all the reasons or all the considerations that we uh, just made. So my inclination is to, to think that we can see arbitrariness arguments not as eliminativist arguments as these arbitrariness critics uh, see them, showing that no reference is fixed because the choice among scientifically precise structural kinds is arbitrary, but as revealing intuitive constraints on the kinds possibly referred to. Now, this is only uh, part of the story. This, what, what I uh, said is basically that uh, 
It is compatible with the uh, meanings of the concepts which appear in the referential intentions in a Kripke pattern picture or a refinement of the Kripke pattern picture. It's compatible with all this that the that the kinds that are referred to uh, by the ordinary rules <coughs> are not scientific kinds, but that they are they may be. Um, for all that the meanings allow, or the meanings of substance and water and all these other concepts allow, they may be vague kinds which are not really scientific kinds. Or well, they are. They may be scientific in part, but they need not be fully reducible, characterizable in scientific terms. Now, this <coughs> is only part of the story because, mm, besides this, one should be able to to argue that, in fact, the referential intentions uh, um, which appear in the uh, mechanism uh, of reference fixing, the correct mechanism of reference fixing, actually manage to determine these particular kinds, these particular vague kinds of, as, the, as the reference. And there are many other uh, interesting questions surrounding this that may uh, come up here. But I think I went uh, about five minutes already. Yeah, we laid up into your discussion. Okay. okay. Thank you. So that's okay. We have questions. So, Alessandro, please. Yeah, so uh, if, I, if I read correctly, you were saying that uh, uh, water is not Sorry, did you, did you say that water is not determined the identical with H2O? That's true. Okay. Because, I mean, or I'm inclined to, to think that in view of the. Of yeah. The I mean, uh, th th there is, a, a, I think, a classical argument. If I'm understanding correctly what is going on here, so I can say that. Uh, water is such that it is not determinately identical with H2O, but H2O is such that it is determinately identical with itself. So H2O and water are not the same because there is some property that distinguishes them, and so they are determinately distinct, and that is the contradiction. Uh, but that they are determinately distinct uh, is what I want to hold. Uh, I mean, I, I understood that you were trying to say that they're only uh, such that they're not determinately identical. Oh, that they are not determinate. No, no, I want to, to hold that in view of this uh, these arguments, uh, we can accept the, the, the criticism of the, of the critics, of the arbitrariness critics. That they are distinct. They're not the same thing. Right. That's my conclusion. And, and the only difference is that they, they conclude that uh, that water cannot be anything, uh, while obviously H2O is something. Uh, I mean, I agree on, with, uh, with you on that. I, I, so did, did I misread that you said that water and H2O are not determined the identity of because um, I remember reading that, but maybe I just misread it, and if maybe. I did, then I apologize. Uh. Well, if I say that somewhere, as you say, it's probably wrong. Well, so anyway, so, so you would say that water and H2O are not just after not determined the identical, but you would say that they are distinct. <coughs> I think they are distinct, yes, because um, water, the ordinary kind of water, has a, a different deterministic profile than H2O, for example, or B2O. Or B2O. Okay, all right, well, thanks. Miguel Angel, please. Yeah, are you, uh, I'm not sure I can ask you because you went very fast at the all this material and it's very complex, but um, you don't want to say that uh, what you call the ordinary meaning of a natural kind term is completely shielded from whatever the scientists uh, say about the, the presumed reference of that natural kind term. 
at the epoch in question, because of science is advancing by that time. And the so, so those advance in the ordinary meaning of words. But you don't want to say that if you take any slice of time, the ordinary meaning of that term at that time is completely independent of whatever scientists say at that time. You don't want to say that. Right? No, I don't. I don't want to say that. So it's it's clearly part of the of the meaning uh, or the a priori connections. Even if it's not part of the, of the meaning of uh, these natural kind of nouns, that um, in order for them to have a reference, there has to be some kind of nature that is shared by at least the paradigms of uh, of the of the kind. And uh, this nature um, is something I believe uh, must be elucidated by science and is something that science must uh, uh, discover in some way. The only thing that I'm denying is that um, this kind of sounds reducible to uh, necessary and sufficient conditions given by, by science. But science may still uh, give you, for example, in fact, this is my my impression is my projection. Science may give you necessary properties of the paradigms. For example, it may discover this. It may discover that uh, well, the paradigms of where are H2O, for example. And this is a discovery. And then uh, the these ordinary kinds or vague kinds that are built around this, around the paradigms. Uh, must be kinds which uh, in some way depend for their nature on the fact that paradigms are H2O. <coughs> One question about the So, my, my question was uh, the same that I, uh, I, I somehow had. So, well, let me try to uh, figure something out to get a better understanding of what we do. So for identity, we require that both uh, sides have the same uh, vagueness profiles. So how, what would prevent the idea? So maybe water is not H2O. Uh, you know, we continue doing science, and we come to something uh, which end up with the same uh, borderline profile or, or softness profile, and then the identity would, would hold. What would prevent you, unless we want to say that some substances are some kind of, of uh, are metaphysically indeterminate, might well be perfectly well be the case, or do you have any reason for believing one way or the other? Or can science continue telling us things in such a way that we can okay. make a identification? Maybe it's not whether it's, it's not H2O, but it might be. Yeah, no, there's a presupposition here that all the scientific candidates um, are going to be just things, this. Um, uh, properties which uh, give you a um, chemical, uh, physical microstructure in, in terms of uh, usual, usual physics or chemistry. Uh, but um, but even though there is this presupposition also in the writings of the critics, of course you may have a, a more um, encompassing understanding of scientific uh, science, so that this includes um, a theory, for example, of these vague kinds that I'm envisioning and other people envision, so that there would be different levels of um, of knowledge and and science, and in other levels there might be investigations um, related to uh, these these vague kinds. This is not something that would be denied by this. Hey, yeah, uh, I was actually wondering, um, so th there is this meta-semantic theory that floats around known as, uh, uh, as reference magnetism, which says that when there are multiple candidates uh, for the meaning of a term and they all equally good, then we may assume that the, the natural, the most natural among them is the actual referent. Um, and this might be a, a strategy for trying to solve this problem and picking exactly one uh, one value. Has anybody considered this? Uh, 
So for you seen the case of water. I haven't seen this particular idea applied in, in this context. Uh, because uh, I suppose the reason must be that uh, none of the uh, microstructural uh, kinds would seem to be more natural than the others, at least to the human mind, I don't think, maybe to God or something like that. So one of those is more natural than the others. Yeah, and of course, yeah, sorry, the, sorry. And of course the, the, this vague kinds that I'm uh, considering or pointing to is not something that these people consider. Um, and also, I wouldn't, of course I would say, from my point of view, this is more natural. Uh, these things, these vague kinds are more natural things than the other things uh, as reference of the, as things that, which satisfy the referential intentions. Uh, though I haven't given you my story about why the referential intentions uh, are satisfied by these vague kinds and not by the more scientific kinds. So at least in that sense, um, these vague kinds would be more natural candidates but this is not, um, I suppose that this uh, idea of the referential magnetism is not uh, really something that uh, can be applied here. It's normally applied, I suppose, in, in other cases in which there are a lot of uh, weird things around and there is one thing that is particularly natural or nice and then, uh, but still the intention or whatever it is that is in the mechanism for picking one over the others doesn't really manage to pick one over the others and then the, the idea of naturalness, naturalness magnetism comes up but this is not a situation well i mean i, I was thinking and, and this is and this might just be an empirically incorrect claim that uh, H2O is the, uh, of all the candidates that we have considered the, the kind that uh, plays the most important role in science. And so yes. that might give us uh, defeasible evidence uh, that that is, that is more natural than the other ones. That might be, uh, but um, I'm not sure about... Um, yeah, I suppose, uh, yeah, I suppose chemically it may be the more natural one in the sense that uh, chemical reactions are more or less uh, identified in terms of H2O and they are more, more or less the same for P2O and B2O but with a different, the difference consisting in the time that the reactions take. So yeah, I suppose maybe you can argue along those lines, yeah, maybe. But still there would be the, the problem that uh, of how to incorporate that into the referential intentions, which if we assume that the kripke pattern picture is the correct one, should play the role, the decisive role in picking up <coughs> the real reference from the other things. Um, and maybe there is some way of incorporating the, this idea of naturalness, um, but it's not something that uh, it's normally taken to be a, a part of the kripke pattern picture. And I don't see it as something that seems to be a part of the intuitive intentions uh, behind the reference fixing here. So that would be first sight. I would be reluctant to go that way. So I'd rather try to think of something else. Also, there are other arguments for um, the idea that the vague kinds are the, the reference. So I would try to give some kind of argument the best explanation something like that for this other possibility so i i'm going to ask a quick question because it's probably going to relate, relate to what you were one of my words is i mean this it's fine with um h2 but go into biology and things fail quite can fail quite miserably so suppose so what, what do you so suppose that you you have sort of um, something like mammal or bird, and you start making these classifications, and you say, well, it's you know natural kind, it's fixed as the Kripke Putnam story say, but then you're saying it's got to be linked, so we don't get into the logistics of the cases. It's got to be linked 
to some sort of science is going to tell you there's some going to be some unifying story, some some necessary condition. That's kind of what you said, and that seems to make sense so that we don't make you know we're just in a natural kind. But so there's well, it is a natural kind now. Well, it is not an ordinary one, but it turns out that it has no reference. It has no reference, right? Yeah, but it is. Oh yeah. Well, 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 well I don't know. Okay, but but the whole point is that it has no reference. So you want things like mammal to have some sort of reference, but there there's great skepticism that actually mammal corresponds. There is anything that is underlying, that's unifying, that's some sort of necessary. I'm not talking about sufficient or anything necessary condition that's going to be satisfied by them. So people go as far as saying, no, look, that's just, you know, a folk biology notion. It has nothing to do <coughs> with anything scientific. Now, in those cases, um, it, it seems to me that the referential intentions of whoever, if they're going to want to introduce these things, right, the referential intentions will fix as a reference, oh, memo, and so on, are going to, um, uh, if you link it to to science, well, first of all, it's kind of hard to bring it to science. I don't think necessarily they had that in mind, but he said substance pieces and everything. And then you are the one who seems to be saying, well, the, it's going to be something that's going to be given by science itself. But if you think that in some cases science is not going to give you that, then do you get a case of phlogiston or not? Because the referential <laughs> intentions mm -hmm. in the case of mammal. So you'd be happy with that. So it's not like yes. you're saying there's going to be something. So these things could come apart. Let me just think of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said in uh, response to Miguel Angel, mm -hmm. this is not, um, you know, happy at every <laughs> natural kind of. Uh, uh, from ordinary language, uh, it's not that um, just by um, forming appropriate intentions and having a, a set of parameters, you're immediately going to have a reference for the, for the natural kind of word. Things have to happen in particular. There has to be a nature uh, that the uh, paradigms uh, share. And uh, the only thing that I that I am inclined to reject the view of the arbitrariness of objections is that this nature has to be specified in terms of uh, scientifically identifiable uh, necessary and sufficient conditions. This is uh, all I want to, to okay. defend. But still, uh, there may be failures of reference when, when there is no uh, nature in this sense, and in order for this to happen, uh, it's enough. Uh, that, there are, that the paradigms don't share a nature in this minimal sense of having a set of necessary uh, conditions, which may be identified by science by the basic. Uh, I think there are other options besides Mr. Fischer, but I'll leave it because I. Well, it's just considering this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a question, uh, because it, it, it's really very uh, uh, mind boggling. Uh, uh, do, do you think nouns, common nouns, Refer in the same way as chemical formulas uh, because I, I think they don't. Like chemical formulas have a way of referring that are different than, than nouns. They are not nouns. Ordinary nouns, you mean? Not ordinary nouns. Like water or yeah. things like that. So, yeah. so for instance, the H in H two O can refer to all types of hydrogen, like deuterium. Or can refer only to one type of hydrogen, but the H, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's not, uh, it doesn't refer unilaterally to just hydrogen without, uh, new, uh, uh, ¿cómo se llama? Este, neutrones. ¿sí? Mm -hmm. The ah. H, the, el hidrógeno puede ser hidrógeno pesado yeah. o hidrógeno. Yes. Uh, ¿sí? yeah. Entonces, ¿cuál es el problema de, de, de usar H2O para. P2O y para D2O. Uh, that's no problem. Uh, H2O, P2O and D2O are H2O. Uh, cases of H2O. Yes, no, that's that's no problem. So the, so what's the pro where, where is the problem uh, in using H2O as water, including uh, P2O and, and D2O? I mean, because well, you, you you never have in nature 
a molecule that's going to stay the same, or a set of molecules of H2O that are going to stay static as H2O or as they are. No. So, so we, I mean, uh, what is the problem of, of, as a formula, having the general case, and then when it's necessary, just splitting up the cases of water, this type of water, another type of water, and... Um, um, well, as far as I, I, as I can tell, uh, it's no problem. And I, I didn't say that was the problem. The problem is um, the problem is that uh, it's unclear what uh, what it is or what it could be in the referential intentions, which are presumably the thing that can manage to uh, or the only thing that can manage to to fix a reference for ordinary nouns. What what? Can be that is there in the in the intentions that manages to pick out H two O H two O as the property of being H two O instead of something uh, as the reference of water I mean, instead of something uh, which is just a proper class of H two O like P two O given that P two O appears to be uh, the kind of H two O that is exemplified by the paradigms, most paradigms of water. In but the but, ordinary I, I, sense but I don't believe that that, 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 that the second thing, that P2O is, 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 is purified uh, in a very artificial way. You don't have that in nature. Uh, and, and so you... you, you neither you, neither you have H2O. It's a technical artifact. H2O, yeah. but for yeah. the so, same so reason, you are talking H2O. about technical artifacts. You're not talking about something in nature. No, of course. Yeah, uh, but yeah. that would be that would mean that uh, also H2O could not be identified with water. That would be a very simple argument. In fact, these these kind of arguments uh, exist in the in the literature. They, they are called the impurities arguments. Um, given that H2O never appears pure in nature, how can you identify water with this, given that water is... Yeah, but, but you do have a class that is hydrogen. Yeah. And hydrogen does have subclasses. And, 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 and so, is, is a reference of hydrogen deuterium, or is a reference of hydrogen uh, just... Uh, uh, that that's that's it's pretty clear that the reference of hydrogen is neither um, protium nor deuterium. It's neither of those. It's uh, a class which encompasses both. Yeah. In fact, other kinds yeah. of, uh, of yeah, hydrogen. Yeah, exactly. That's clear. Uh, and you that's can you, you can move that to water. Well, no. The, well, the idea is that you can't do that because um, you have all these uh, intuitive uh, claims or ideas about what's true intuitively about water, uh, taken as the ordinary kind, the intuitive kind. Uh, these arguments. Uh, it seems as if uh, it seems as if um, when you discover that these uh, paradigms of water are H2O, but also that they are P2O, which is a more restrictive kind than H2O. When you discover things of this kind, or when you discover that um, paradigmatic water is, um, uh, is ortho water, right? uh, when you discover these things, then you, uh, you get this feeling, this intuitive feeling, that nothing in your um, referential intentions, the referential intentions of the ordinary person, um, who is the person who, by means of these intentions, is fixing or contributing to fix the, the reference of these ordinary nouns? There seems to be nothing that could have been, um, uh, you know, foreseen in these intentions, and that could pick out H two O over P two O or vice versa. That's the that's the problem. But the, the um, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's just we're on top of the yeah, okay. philosophy of mind thing, but you guys can continue this. Okay. I think it's a really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you.